today is the day that I want to deal with Socrates. I only want to deal with him today. We are going to move on tomorrow and start a discussion of Plato, which is why I want to kind of hurry up and get going here, because time is somewhat limited. You may have noticed uh, from the reading that Socrates is describing two sets of accusers. One set he calls ancient, and then the other set we can call current. The current accusers are, of course, the ones that have resulted in the fact that Socrates is being tried in Athens before a jury of 250 men who are adjudicating his case. What was the crime that was part of the accusation of the ancient accusers? What's going on with the ancient accusers? Mr. Dupree, go ahead. Uh, he said that he was making the worse appear better. That's right. He was making the worse appear better. There's a, there's a quote that you probably caught. I think it's on the second page there. I don't have it right in front of me. Anything else? Go ahead, Ben. He was teaching other people the right doctrine. Okay, he was teaching it to other people. He was influencing the community. That's right. Anything else on that? Go ahead. He searches um, into things under the earth and in heaven. Yes. Searches under the earth and in heaven. So Socrates has been controversial for a long time. What's the date of his execution? What year are we in right now? in terms of his uh, trial and execution. It is the year? 399. 399. That should be emblazoned in your memory banks. 399. The recent history of Athens has involved what great events or conflicts? What's gone on in the last 100 years or so? Just keep banging away on this till you recite it in your sleep. What happened? Let's, let's go back to the years let's say uh, 500 down to about the year 480. What's going on in Athens, Sydney? That's the Persian Wars. Who wins the Persian Wars? Avery, who wins the Persian Wars? Please, my son. Who won the Persian Wars? Greatest John, uh, David and Goliath event in history besides the biblical David. And... <laughs> the Greeks, thank you, yes. It was the Greeks. And the Greeks, of course, were very proud of themselves because they had just chased off the biggest empire in the history of the world. This little pipsqueak bunch in Greece had chased those people right out of the region. And they were proud of themselves. And that launched, you know, first of all, the Delian League, but also a whole period that's usually called the Golden Age, in which the Greeks are really celebrating their greatness. The Athenians, particularly, in the form of their kind of democratic ideas and institutions under the great Athenian leader, whose name is was the great, say it, say it boldly. Heracles. Now stand up and say it. Heracles. Absolutely correct and wonderful. So he's the guy. And Socrates is a player in Athens during that period. <laughs> Socrates is a significant personality in uh, Athens during that time. But what happens is that the Athenians and the Greek world in general, you know, after a while, be, begin in a sense to beat up on themselves. And so we have this second set of wars down here called the Peloponnesian War. So we have this golden age sandwiched between two eras of warfare. The Peloponnesian Wars were really a philosophical battle between Sparta, which stood for hard core oligarchy, and Athens, which stood more for democracy. You remember from last year, our studies of civics, Aristotle taught us there's basically two forms of government, right? Oligarchy, democracy. 
And that's the great conflict over those two forms of government that are fought during this 30 years or so, known as the Peloponnesian Wars. Yes? What are the specific dates for the Peloponnesian Wars? So the Peloponnesian Wars are going to start in about the year 430 and go down to 404. And that leaves the Greek world totally changed. Here, everything was wonderful. We're building the Parthenon. You know, you've seen all that stuff. Now, at the end of the Peloponnesian Wars, everybody's like a bloody stump. I mean, it's just we beat ourselves to a pulp. And the whole meaning of what it is to be Greek and what it is to be even human has been you know, put on the table. Well, the Spartans who won the Peloponnesian conflict put in place in Athens for about four years the so-called Rule of the Thirty. They imposed oligarchy in democratic Athens. It didn't work. And finally, after about four years, these oligarchs go home and leave Athens back in its democratic systems. And the first thing the democratic people do in Athens is they turn their guns on those who were viewed as sympathetic to oligarchy, sympathetic to Sparta, and Socrates is one of those people. So he's brought up on criminal charges, but the ch there's charges and then there's the real charges, you see. The facial charges, well, he's corrupting the young. He's you know, teaching us to worship other gods. The real political concern about Socrates was he seemed to be hostile to democracy. He was hostile to those Athenian you know, concerns that were attempting to defend Athens from her enemies. So he comes to trial in 399, and that's really uh, what's going on. So that's why Socrates refers back to these prior accusers. And there's one particular guy he mentions in that connection by name, who is one of those most famous accusers of him. And the guy's name is, Kaylee, do you know? Miletus. Not Miletus, that's one of his current accusers. This is a guy that comes from way back, an earlier time. Do you know? I was say he mentioned like Anaximander. He does mention Anaximander, that's your close, but it's not that one. It is, it's not, no one we've mentioned yet. It is, Sydney? Exactly. Sometimes you amaze me. Aristophanes. Aristophanes, who is a poet. And he writes a, a play, a poetic comedy play, in the year 423. And it's entitled, Sydney. Did you catch the title? Anybody catch the title of it? It's entitled, Laura? Clouds. Clouds. Notice Socrates is referring to Aristophanes' play written in 423, which is right in the middle of the, one of the hottest times of the Peloponnesian Wars. What's going on in, in the uh, play The Clouds? Have you ever read The Clouds before? It's kind of a fun read, actually. Do you, uh, do you know what's going on? What is? Well, I don't know the storyline, but in this, it said that um, there was a main character that was named uh, Socrates, mm -hmm. and he was kind of just the cuckoo guy, I guess. And yeah, fun that's right. And it's no accident. This, this play was intended to be a mockery of Socrates himself. And so the guy in the play whose name Socrates is referring to the Socrates we all know and love. And the entire purpose of the play was to poke fun at him. And the theory of the play was that Socrates is a guy who just floats around in the clouds. He's just kind of this weirdo. And in the play, he's the head of a group called the Thinkery. And all they do is think. And at the end of the play, the thinkery gets burned down, you see. So it's like a happy ending, the destruction of the thinkery. 
Because, and this is the important point, Aristophanes is a poet, and that means he stands in conflict with a new tradition in Athens called philosophy. It's poetry versus philosophy. That's what's going on. When I say Greek poetry, who do you think of? Josiah, who's the greatest Greek poet? Homer. And if you were to read Homer, Stephen, what kinds of people are heroic in Homer? Guys like Odysseus who are really strong and smart. And what else? What's, what's the kind of the, 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 the great, uh, you like that? I'll do that again. Yeah, that's right. I assumed you were. Yeah, I, mean, I take it for granted. I, yes, but uh, what else? What's the what's the heroic uh, kind of uh, image in, in uh, the Iliad and Odyssey and Homer's writings? What does he look like? I mean, you give an examples. Hector. Or no, you didn't mention Hector, but uh, Odysseus. What are they all like? What are the great heroes of of uh, you know Homer's? Yeah, what are they like? What are these guys like? If one walked in the room here, what, what would it be like? Muscles. What else? Maybe. <laughs> Swords. They're warriors, right? These guys are warriors. You want to you wanna settle a dispute with one of these guys? You don't sit down and talk about it. You don't have a conversation. You don't have a dialogue. You see, you go out in the battlefield and you swing stuff at each other till one of you is dead, and that determines who got the right answer. You know, who's who's got uh, you know the right uh, position in the in the conflict is settled on the battlefield. That's the poetic tradition in Greece, and that's what they were trying to inspire in Athens during the Peloponnesian Wars. They were trying to inspire in these people a kind of Homeric heroism. Let's go out and sock it to the bad guys and, and prove, you know, that we're the better warriors and so on. Right in the middle of that comes a guy named Socrates who says, hey, how about let's just talk? How about let's just figure out the real meanings of words? How about let's just let reason guide us? Instead of being warriors and celebrating that poetic tradition, let's be philosophers and celebrate kind of rational tradition. And Socrates was viewed as an enemy of the state for doing that. He was like someone engaged in sedition. He was undermining the warrior spirit and was viewed as a friend of Sparta because he was demoralizing the troops. You see how that works? That's what's going on. And people remembered that. Aristophanes writes this play. Aristophanes is a poet. He's in the tradition of Homer. And he thinks, you know, he thinks Socrates is a goofball. He makes the weaker argument strong. He turns things on their head. He floats in the clouds. What an idiot. Get rid of this guy. You know, that's kind of the force of the, of the play. And Socrates has been dealing with that down through the years. That's been part of the, you know, the assault on him, and that's what he refers to here. But the question is, and this is really the point of this reading you just had, this is Socrates on trial in democratic Athens, but it's also democratic Athens on trial before the tribunal of philosophy. That's what's going on. That's how, that's how Plato is presenting this. It's a pretty fair record probably of what happened, but it's, it's tweaked just so that it puts Athens on trial and Socrates is the judge and he's evaluating this city you know and this my friends is the proper beginning of philosophy I mean we've talked about the pre-Socratics Thales Anaximander and all these guys and they're all important but all of them tended to be more or less natural scientists that was their their kind of view you know their their interest now along comes Socrates and he's really trotting out for the first time philosophy as such. 
and say, you know, this is the way we should do life. We shouldn't, we shouldn't settle disputes by throwing spears at each other. We should step down and talk through to the right answer. And reasonable minds should be able to do that. Well, he's challenging, of course, that whole poetic tradition. And uh, as it turns out, Athens is not prepared to go there yet. And they wind up executing Socrates. But interestingly, Socrates becomes the martyr, you know, that actually then justifies that whole new beginning of a new way of life in Athens. Sometimes it takes a martyr to do that. You know, sometimes someone has to die for people to come to their senses and realize something. So anyway, that's kind of the way he's viewed. There's two great values at stake in terms of the apology. One is the method of teaching. How should we educate the young? Is at least one of the themes that's kind of bouncing around in this. And the other is to what virtues should we be educating people? So how should we teach? And to what end should we be teaching? If you were going to be educated in the world envisioned by Homer, Krista, what does an education look like? If you are educated in Homer's world, then what does an education look like? P.E.? <laughs> mm -hmm. It looks a lot like P.E., that's right. What, what particular sorts of uh, fun things are we doing in P.E. if you're in Homer's world? We're fighting, that's right. We are learning the art of, that's Sparta. We're learning the art of war. You know, this, you know in Sparta, that's what little kids learned from the time they were seven years old. They got seven years with mommy, then they were turned over to a master who would whip them, beat them, kick them, you know, cause them pain, and train them to be warriors, train them to be impervious to pain. Uh, and it was a hard life in Sparta, but they produced the greatest warrior class in the world. You know. Well, Athens was doing a little bit of that themselves. And along comes Socrates and says, you know, that's not what education should look like. Education should look like something that focuses on the mind and on reason rather than on the body and just being able to beat the pulp out of my neighbor. It should be a little different thing. So the nature of education changes and the virtues change. You know, the virtues, Matthew, if you live in Homer's world, are what? What are the great virtues of a Homeric hero? Uh, honor. honor. Power. Power. Like Stuff like that. <laughs> what else? <laughs> it's good. Honor, power, those are great answers. What else? What's other virtues of Homer's heroes? Go ahead. Uh, glory. Glory, exactly. How much do you see Socrates worrying about glory? How much is he out there just wanting to get glory? You see, his great claim to glory is he knows nothing, and he actually knows that he knows nothing. You think you'd ever hear Achilles say that, or Hector say that, you know? This is, you see how different it is. This is the great collision of the ancient world, and this is really where philosophy uh, begins to get traction because for Socrates the great virtues are reason, reason of, you know, reasoning through, thinking critically, analyzing the words that are being used to see if those words comport with reality, to see if there's contradiction or absurdity in the case that I'm making, and to have the humility to recognize it and if I've got a bad argument to abandon it. You see, do you, do you see the difference? It's huge, and this is really, and, and I think personally, I don't know, I think it's rather Christian. I mean, Socrates is not a Christian to my knowledge. He lived 400 years before Christ, so that makes it difficult to be a Christian. But there is something appealing, isn't there, about that from a Christian point of view. Not that Christians can't be warriors, I'm not, don't, don't get me wrong here, but that the Christian's first impulse when he's in a disagreement with someone is not to punch their lights out. 
You know? You become a Christian or I'm going to break your face. Well, wait a minute. You know, maybe there's a better way to do evangelism. We Christians kind of like to think that we can reason, Jesus says, or God says through you know, Isaiah, come let us reason together, says the Lord. That idea. So that's been somewhat appealing, I think, in Christian history. All right. Having said that, what I'd like to do uh, is just sort of distill, if I can, what I think are at least maybe three fundamental uh, what themes, I guess, in Socrates. Socrates is not, he doesn't give us an elaborate philosophy. He's sort of the beginning of it. He's the wellspring of it. But most of what, we, in fact, all that we know about Socrates is from Plato. And we're going to move to Plato tomorrow. But I'd like to at least give you three little kind of, what, themes that we can cling to with respect to Socrates. The first of them, interestingly, I'll just be simply the meaning of words. He liked to challenge the sophists of Athens who like to use words for their persuasive effect. This is the mark of a demagogue, someone that likes to use words, not because of their actual meaning, but because of their <coughs> effect, their emotional effect, you know, their psychological effect. Hitler was brilliant at using words, not because under analysis the words were true or reasonable, but because they tended to get people juiced up. And you see those videos of Hitler just like a whack job guy, you know, his hair is flying and he's saying, he's saying, what is he saying? He's saying things like, it is our destiny, you know, and we are the greatest. And, you know, he's just saying these things that you think, well, wait a minute now, let's, let's look at this, actually. But nobody wanted to look at it. They just wanted to sort of get excited about the, the words without considering them. And Socrates would hear that kind of thing in Athens and he said, no, wait a minute, let's, let's, you're talking about destiny. What is that word? Justice. What does that mean? He liked to parse words, take them apart, find the truth in them, find the fluff in them. And that got him in a lot of trouble, but it was one of the things that he did very, very well. Plato likes to use that as the basis for all of these dialogues that he reports to us about um, Socrates. The second uh, little theme in Socrates that you want to hang on to is the priority of the soul over the body. Soul over body. Which is more important in Homer? Alicia, where would you find the emphasis in Homer? Definitely the body. The body. You know, your musculature your stature. For Socrates, Socrates, by the way, is notoriously uh, remembered as a guy who was basically pretty ugly. At least the best pictures of him don't show him as kind of like this real handsome, you know, Tom Cruise kind of guy. He's, uh, <laughs> or I don't know, who is it now? See, probably date myself again, right? <laughs> I used to talk about Robert Redford, but that's so far back there. You guys said, Robert Redford, who's that? Anyway, Brad Pitt, is he still on the list? No, he's off the list. <laughs> Avery. Um, where would you put our culture today? That? I don't know, good question. Where would you put our culture today? I, that's a great question. Where do you think your culture today would put the emphasis on the virtues of the soul? Integrity, virtue, truthfulness, purity, or the body? Good looks, image, suave. Where do you think the, uh, where would the emphasis, yeah, I, I think, I think, you know, any, any culture where one of the most common uh, messages of the media is image is everything. You know, 
I'd say that probably is a little bit more of a, that could be debated, but that'd be off the top of my head, my thought. All right, third, simply the true nature of virtue. True virtue. Socrates is concerned about what is really good. And good does not necessarily mean you win on the battlefield. It comports to some sort of ultimate and eternal idea of the good. So, uh, as I say, Socrates, to our knowledge, never wrote anything. We have no document that comes from the pen of Socrates. Everything we know about him is from Plato. And Socrates invariably is the hero of Plato's dialogues. It'll always be Socrates versus somebody, you know. And the further you get into Plato, the further you get from the original Socrates. But he always stands in, in Plato's mind as the great kind of champion of this philosophic approach to things. And uh, so we'll start Plato tomorrow. Josiah. Since you don't have any advice by Socrates, yeah. There's, uh, you know, there's virtually no doubt that he existed in the minds of the vast majority of, I mean, it would be almost unthinkable to think, well, there never was really a Socrates. Um, we have references to him from others than Plato, but Plato gives us by probably 99% of what we know of Socrates, we know from Plato. But uh, you at least see hints of him uh, in others, certainly in, you know, Thucydides, who gives us a history of the, uh, I erased it here, the Peloponnesian Wars. Um, others who come later casually refer to Socrates, never in any great detail, but it just seems pretty likely. It's the same kind of problem you have with Jesus of Nazareth. He never wrote a word, except some words on sand that when he was with the, you know, the John 8 situation. We don't have any documents from Jesus. We have all kinds of documents written by others who were with him. And the consensus is there really was a Jesus of Nazareth. There really was. We as Christians take that as a matter of faith. But even in a skeptical world that isn't Christian, it's more or less pretty much taken, you know, for granted. There was somebody back there. It's kind of the same way with Socrates. There's just too much, um, too much evidence to think the guy was completely concocted. So I, I, that would be, I think, the view general. Yeah. Um, did he not write anything, or did we just not have any of his? There's no record of him having written anything. He may have written something. Maybe he wrote a check, you know, in a <laughs> grocery store or something like that. But, um, uh, there's no reference to him having written anything. To my knowledge, in all of Plato's writings, there's no reference to that. His activity was to go around Athens asking hard questions to people who purported to have the answers. He liked to embarrass politicians in public, and that got him on their bad list, you know, pretty rapidly. So he wasn't a writer. He wasn't, uh, he, was a, he was a true philosopher. He was out doing the work of philosophy, which is always conversation, not just writing. Good questions.